You've been watching, or will watch, our feature Boss, that starred Fred the Hammer Williamson. Fred, you have had such a wide career. You've had such a varied life. Athlete, and we're talking about first class athlete, we're talking about an actor, we're talking about a sportscaster. Uh, let's talk about your, your, your college career first, because that came first. Uh, you were a star at Northwestern University. I went to uh, Northwestern on a track scholarship. I wasn't really touted as a football player. I was a guy that was 205 pounds, who ran the 100, who ran the 440, and who won the shot put. I was Big Ten shot put champ, 100 yard dash, 440. Uh, everything is, is relative to timing. My r first year there, Eric Parsegan came at the same time that I did. He saw me running track one day and he asked me if I ever played football. And I said, no, nah, not really. I mean, I wasn't really excited about playing football. So he asked me if I would change my scholarship, he would be very happy and uh, pay dividends to me, you know, give me a couple cookies and a couple candy bars. And, and I said, certainly, I'll, I'll change mine. So he, uh, he, he turned me into a wide receiver. It was because of Eric Parsegan that I became a football player. You really were a pioneer in doing that because so many other athletes, and you look at an athlete like Bob Hayes, who was an Olympic track star, uh, he became uh, a very popular wide receiver for the Dallas flanker back in those days for the Dallas Cowboys. But you were really the pioneer when it came to that. Pioneer is something that I've always been conscious of because I've always been conscious of who I am, always had a goal, always knew where I was going, and always knew what I was going to do. My one career you missed from Northwestern, I graduated with an architecture and engineering degree, so I worked for seven years during the off-season when I was playing pro football for Bechtel Steel as a chief architect for Bechtel. So I was designing buildings in Dubai before Dubai was ever on the map. Everybody knows about Dubai now because it's because of the conflict that we're in. But back in the, in the 60s, I was designing energy buildings for Dubai for Bechtel Steel. You said I, I wanted to, to show who I am. For those of you, for those who don't know who you are, who is Fred Williamson? I'm a person who does whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do it, and as often as they want to do it. I control my own destiny as much as I possibly can. That's why I became a producer, a director, a writer, a star behind, in front of the camera, because when I first decided to go to Hollywood, uh, I had an image of myself. I was going to Hollywood to be the hero, to be the star. But I knew at the time, in the 60s, that just wasn't happening for, for blacks to come into the business and become the hero and become the star. So I let them make me a marketable commodity, as I had already let football make me a marketable commodity, because I, I always understood marketing. So I let them make me by accepting a role to play Diane Carroll's boyfriend in the Julia show. My first movie was M.A.S.H., I played Spear Chucker. Second movie was Tell Me You Love Me, Junie Moon, starring Liza Minnelli. So by then, I figured people knew who I was, and so I took that commodity away from them, created my own company, Po' Boy Productions, started raising money for my own films, and started making my own films. Consequently, I've made about 40, 40 films as a producer, director, writer and starred in obviously in all my films. But then when I went to Hollywood, I had to do my own thing because I had three rules. One, you can't kill me. Two, I got to win all my fights in the movie. Three, I get the girl at the end of the movie if I want her. They weren't ready for me because of the 60s and because that wasn't happening. And I said, thank you, and then I go make my own movies. You used some, some real, you talk about old school, old time actors like, like Donald Red Barry who, uh, made his name in those westerns of the 40s and, and R.G. Armstrong. You really gave this film in a way an homage to old school acting as well as film production. 
Donald Barry, and it's, this had to be just before he, he committed suicide, yeah. uh, was one of your players. R. G. Armstrong, another with that, that great drawl. He had one of the sweetest voices, did, did R. G. Armstrong. Uh, uh, you know, talk about, you know, your, 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 you know, bringing these guys, giving them one more shot. A, a lot of what another uh, Hollywood veteran, A.C. Lyles, did. Uh, he brought a lot of the old-time Hollywood players back. It, it, this is almost as an homage to them, isn't it? Yeah, but see, old school is always the best school. The, the new guys always feel that they discovered something, that they don't give due to the guys who were there before them. And Don Redberry, I remember Don Redberry in the Westerns back in uh, when I was in high school. He used to jump up. His favorite punch was jumping way up in the air and throwing a right hook and knocking the guy out. That was his finale punch. Armstrong was a guy you know would always give you a, a sound performance. And so I knew that I could get great performances from these guys without spending a lot of money because I didn't have a lot of money to... Uh, to hire top name actors, but I went for the performances, and, the, and I knew these guys would, would do that, which would make the picture, you know, even better. You know, you if you watch a picture for performances, you don't always watch for names because names don't mean box office anymore. Performances means box office. And in essence, you were the name. Yeah, I, I care. I knew I had my market. I knew my market. I knew what I had to do. Win the fights. Don't die and get the girl. Okay. So I knew my market. I knew what my fans wanted to see me do. And, and to be that, that tough guy because it was a time, it was a period in American black history where we needed heroes. There were no heroes. I was the beginning along with my comrades that I put into my movies too, which were Jim Brown, Richard Roundtree, Billy D. Williams. We were the beginning, especially me and Jim, were the beginning of, of the tough guy, the winner, the black, the black hero. When the smoke cleared, we were the ones left standing. That was something that was needed at that time, and I was very conscious of that. That's why those films were so hot and so popular in the, in the early 70s, from 70 to 75. Every film that had a black star was a big success. You, you talked about powerful men. You talked about strong men, like, like a Billy D. Williams and like a Jim Brown. Uh, and, and yet you started and you brought this up, so I'm just going to take it from where it goes. Working with Julia, well, you were very sensitive in working with Diane Carroll and, of course, one of the greats in the business, Lloyd Nolan. You, you showed a very vulnerable side, and, and yet I, I don't think you, you, did, you showed much vulnerability or sensitivity, maybe is a better word, in your later films. Why is that? Well, I was looking first for a new career. When I, when I did Julia's show, I was looking for a new career. When I stopped doing the off-season, I worked for Bechtel Steel, so it was six months of Bechtel and six months of football. So that was okay, I could handle that transition. But once I retired from football and went full time sitting behind the desk, I lasted about nine months when the walls started to close in on me, it got very small. So I just realized I could not do this for the rest of my life, take an hour off for lunch and work nine to five and punch a clock. It just did not fit my personality. So I was looking for something else to do. One day I decided after watching Julia's show for many times, I was going to go straight to Hollywood and become Dan Kill's boyfriend on the Julia show. So I was in San Francisco at the time. I drove to Hollywood. About three days later, I was in front of the producer signing a contract to play her, her boyfriend because I went to him and told him, I'm just what you need. You need somebody tall, dark, and handsome like me to play opposite Dan Carroll because each week your new guest star role is a new boyfriend. So what you need is a regular boyfriend to play on the show. So that's how I got the part. So from the Julia show, timing was everything. We did it at 20th Century Fox lot. I happened to be in the commissary one day when a guy walks by and looks at me and he says, you, uh, you're the hammer, right? I said, yeah. He says, like, I'm, I'm getting ready to make a movie. I got a football game in it. I don't know anything about football. Would you direct all the football scenes? And I said, yeah, the movie was MASH. So that was my first directing job, was directing the football scenes. And I said, I made more money between those two shows, and I did my whole 10-year professional football career. So I said I should have been doing this a long time ago. And Robert Altman, Robert uh, Altman. never never regretted the fact that that's got to be one of the greatest staged football scenes yeah. ever in a movie. It and was, that, uh, it was it's like, one of the great movies of all I hired all the players. I got all the players together. I brought in some pros. I brought in Buck Buchanan. I brought in Timmy Brown. I brought in the Super Nat. I brought in about 10 pros so we could get some real live hitting and without faking the hitting so we could make it real, and, and we did. Let's go back to the NFL. 
you were drafted out of college by the San Francisco 49ers. Played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And then you were one of the ones that benefited by the war between the leagues when the AFL was, was formed. And you wound up with Lamar Hunt and the Kansas City Chiefs, really one of the echelon franchises. Well, you know, I was number two draft choice, 49ers. Show how times really change. I, my signing bonus was $1,900. My starting salary was 9005 at the time, White Tittle was a quarterback for the 49ers, and he was making 10000 So I'm at the top of the echelon. So they, the first day, first day of practice, they give me a red shirt. And I figure, well, you know, they give me a red shirt because I'm a special person. It means I'm, I'm, I'm a hot shot in camp. He says, no, 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 son, you're playing defense. I said, what do you mean defense? I'm an All-American flanker back. Don't you know who I am? You drafted me. I catch the ball. Anywhere you throw the ball, I'm going to catch the ball. Don't you know? He says, son. You're going to have to play defense. We know you're fast, and so well, you have to cover fast guys in the, in the league because we got really fast receivers, and we don't have anybody on our team that as fast as you that can cover people like that. So after about two weeks of practice, I, I mean, I'm looking crazy, man. I can't cover nobody. I'm running backwards. I don't have no idea about how to cover anybody, how to run backwards. I had no idea what I was doing. So he comes to me, and he says, son, you're not going to make this team. So I, you know, I went to my room that night and I said, you know, there's no way I'm going back to the ghetto and tell my boys that I, I wasn't tough enough to make the pro football team because they know I'm tough in the ghetto. I got a tough image. Now, I ain't tough enough to make a pro football team. I'm not going back with that, with that stigma. So I came out the next day and I lined up like two, two yards off of, y, off of uh, R.C. Owens. So the coach is Red Hickey. He's going, Williamson, get back, get back. I said, there's no way. I'm not getting back. I'm covering this guy from right here. So he got very disgusted. He says, all right, go ahead, make him, make him look bad. So R.C. on, they said, Hut, R.C. on took a step off, and I hit him. I gave him a shot right on the chest, knocked him down, knocked, him, knocked the wind out of him. He's laying down there, and he's almost, he can't breathe. Coach comes running over, and he says, damn it, Williamson, what are you doing? I said, I covered him. He said, yeah, you did, didn't you? He says, okay, cover this guy. So he sends out Money Stickles from Notre Dame, 240-pound tight end. He says, okay, cover him. So I do the same thing. Money comes up. I'm like two yards off of Money. He tries to run over me. I hit him with a shot. He hits me back with a shot. Now we're on the ground. We're fighting. Coach runs over and says, God dang it. He says, Money, they just killed the quarterback. Why are you out here fighting with Williamson? They just killed the quarterback. Would you? And he looks at me and he says, would you stop hammering my players so I could get some pass offense in? And by the way, you made the team. So that's how I got the name Ham. And that's how you got the name Ham. Right. You, you talk about R.C. Owens. I just have to talk about this as an aside. I think what people don't realize about R.C. Owens and Y.A. Tittle, in fact, was they had the great play, the alley-oop play, where Tittle would throw it up, and Owens had such a great jumping ability, he would actually leap over a defender and make it impossible to defend that play. Anybody that's going to do an alley-oop on me is going to come down on the ground the same way. They're going to be laying on the ground stretched out because you are vulnerable when you lay yourself out like that. And, and, but, it, you know, he survived it because they weren't really crushing people like that until I got in the league. I'm the guy who really started all that hammer stuff and, and really trying to take a lick on the, on, the, on the pass receivers and get respect. It was all about pass coverage. My, you know, the, the bump and run, they started calling it. But then, again, being a pioneer, I never got the credit because I didn't bump to run with anybody. I bumped to leave you there. I didn't want to run with you. I wanted to bump you so I wouldn't have to run with you. So then they finally named it after my rookie year. They started naming it Bump and Run, but I didn't get the credit for it. And interestingly enough, that was the staple of the AFL. You jumped to the AFL yeah. uh, again with the Chiefs, and, and that really made the bump. That, that league's rules in, in the secondary yeah. made the Bump and Run popular. They didn't change it until after I retired. When I retired, then they changed it. You couldn't bump them within five yards. You, 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 within five yards, you could bump them. After five yards, you couldn't bump them. But that was my rule. You, so they changed it after. They couldn't, they couldn't do it while I was playing. After I retired, then they changed the rule. You've done so much on the field, played in the Super Bowl, uh, really made yourself a great reputation as a football player. What was the number one highlight of your career that you think back upon? greatest football highlight is making the team, being come one of the pros, because back in the day, being a pro was much more important than it is today. If you were a professional, that means they knew who you were, they knew your name. 
I'm spending money calling my guys back in Chicago saying, man, guess where I am? I'm in the 49 camp. This is now, man, you, you cross the street. You're not nowhere. I'm telling you, I made the team. That was the most important, to be called a professional, to be a professional, to be a special football player and know all these superstars that you've watched over the years and you know them and they know you. That, to me, was my greatest achievement. You went to the Monday Night Football booth and you worked with Frank Gifford and you worked with Howard Cosell. Talk about that experience. Well, see, I never really wanted to go into the booth. That was really not my thing. I was, I'm always about moving forward. Going into the booth with me is like uh, reliving old football games where you sit in the bar and talk about what, what game it was and what the score was and what you did. They came to me to do Monday Night Football and I said, I will do Monday Night Football if you give me three movies of the week for me to produce, direct, and star in, then I will consider doing Monday Night Football because I wasn't, wasn't interested in doing Monday Night Football. So they made a deal with me. He says, okay, you can produce, you can direct, you can do that. Then they took me on a tour with Howard Cosell to see how he and I would get along, which was probably the worst thing they could do because I took over all the conversations where we were and they took us to the black community and the black stations. And that was really destructive because they only talked to me. And Howard couldn't make any, any contributions to the conversation that they wanted to talk about. So Howard was totally in intimidated by me. So by the time we got to the first game, he wouldn't even talk to me. He would talk about whatever it was on his mind to Frank, and he would ignore any comments that I would make. So we'd sit in the booth, and he would ignore me. So it was not a good, uh, it was not good chemistry between me and, and, and uh, Howard. Couldn't talk to Frank because Frank didn't know what he was talking about. Frank had a spotter on each side of him telling him who ran the ball, who caught the ball, because sometimes Frank wasn't altogether there mentally. But uh, it was an experience. But And then when, when I went to do my films, uh, they, uh, they said, okay, we're just going to pay you off. And, uh, and you're not doing very well with Howard. And I said, it's fine. I'll do my movies. This is now we're just going to pay you off for three movies of the week. Just give you the check, and you can go. I said, it's fine. I'll take that too. What was more challenging to you, making a movie or playing football? Making a movie is easy. That's nothing. I mean, challenging is is, is football. Football, you use all, everything you you can muster up as a as a human being. Your your physical side, your intellectual side. Your, your physical challenge, your, the, the competitiveness, you know, uh, that doesn't exist in, 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 the, in the movie business, you know. It, movie business to me is fun because I play football. It's not fun to me because I wanted to be an actor. I never wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a movie star. I just didn't want to do a nine-to-five job. I didn't want to do a job, you know. This is uh, maybe Howard Cosell calling me now. Call this off here. No, Howard, I'm busy right now, man. I can't come to the phone. Okay, thank you, man. Not, 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 not the Howard Cosell. That's the guy that intimidates, uh, that, that pretends to be Howard Cosell. That's the guy who, who talks just like Howard on, on television shows. Not you, Howard. You can go back, go back to your rest, dog. I'm not, <laughs> go back to your resting place, dude. All right. Talk about the movies that you've made. Is the one, uh, let's break this down into two separate categories. Of the mainstream movies that you've made, you, you seem to talk with a lot of passion about MASH. Uh, of the black exploitation movies that you've made, is there one that stands out? No, see, my, my career is relative to my personality. I only do what I like. I don't do anything I don't want to do. I don't do anything that's destructive to my image or destructive to my character, whether it's mainstream or whether it's something that I feel I can do and make a lot of money with. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't fit me, then I don't do it. MASH was something that was football player, you know, okay, so that, that worked fine for me. All the other films that I've, I've done fit my image, which I discussed with you, which is you can't kill me, I get my girl, and, and so forth and so on. So that's important to me. Uh, I like and want to like the guy that I see in the mirror and that's looking back at me. I don't want to have to try to explain to him why I did this and why I did that. That's not possible because he ain't listening. So that's why I look the way I do with no stress in my life because I don't accept the stress. I give the stress back to people who give it to me. I, I cannot believe that you are 70 years old. Big I mean, seven I look old. at you. I'm a wonderful, well-kept, stress-free 70. You are, you're, you're, you look incredible. Uh, you know, 
we see your face right now. And I still do my own stunts. I, I never got hurt. I got no pain. I got no aches. I got no bad knees. I got no bad shoulders. I still do my own stunts because they don't have any stuntmen in Hollywood my size. They're all Eddie Murphy size. They're all, you know, uh, Denzel Washington size. And those guys are 5'10". There's no 6'3", six, 6'4", six, stuntman in Hollywood. So I do my own stunts. And, and that's part of the, the reason I'm in the business. What's I like secret? doing that. My secret? Black jelly beans. Don't eat the white ones, dude. You played football in the 60s. Yeah. You look at football in the 90s and the 2000s. Different game, different mentality. Do you wish you could have been playing now as opposed to having played then? No, I, I, I think that, that the maturity that I achieved in my life came from playing from the 60s because the achievements that I made were important to me as an individual and not important to me because there were financial gains attached. It was, it was a moment of being an achiever and achieving goals. The goals today are not about personality and character, it's about money. Anytime your goal is about money, I think you're a loser from the start because money, money goes and, you, and you're left with you. These, the game has changed because money has changed the game. Being a pro is no longer important to these guys. You're, now you're only as good as what you can negotiate. That's what makes a good football player. How many Heisman Trophy winners really turned out to be productive football players? How many first top five draft players turn out to be top football players? Lots of them come from sixth round, seventh round, eighth round. I mean, it, the money has changed the game and it's changed the philosophy of the player as to why he played the game. You're working on a lot of different projects now. I had a chance to look at your resume, and you're working on a number of different projects now. I guess a Reader's Digest version, talk about the different items that are coming out, the different roles you're playing, both in front and behind the camera, and, and how this is fulfilling your life. Well, I just finished a film that's an unusual character for me. I finished it, I shot it ironically in Kansas City. I played a lawyer, an ACLU lawyer, who was stopping a mayor from hanging Christmas decorations on City Hall, which is against the, the separation of church and state, which is also against the Constitution. So uh, that was an interesting role for me to play. Uh, I won the case. That was necessary. Uh, I'm off to Jamaica. Did you get the girl? There was no girl. <laughs> there was no girl. Had there been one? Yes. <laughs> but you see, I said, if I want her. So there's always that negotiation there. I'm off to Jamaica to do a film uh, called Black Kissinger, which is a James Bond movie. I did a Bond type movie in like 1970, before the so-called black exploitation. I did it for Universal Studios. It was called That Man Bolt. We shot it in Hong Kong, we shot it in Japan, we shot, we shot in Las Vegas and LA. And I, I was a tuxedo wearing guy who was a courier. And it was a really good film, but it was ahead of its time, even though it was, it was uh, Financially successful, I think it made about 90 million. We made it for five million. It made 90 million, um, and I was under contract to Universal. I had a three-picture deal with Universal. This is 1970. So they called me in and they said the picture was successful, but we don't know what to follow up with, and we don't want to be the first to make s black films with black stars. So they paid me off. Here's another company just paid me off, just gave me money for three movies. This is 1971, I mean 70. Then bam, 71, here comes Shaft. And now here's a whole run of pictures. Now Universal calls me back and says, we'd like to make some pictures. And I said, I'm not interested. I've already formed my own company. I don't need you anymore, thank you very much. And I went off with Black Caesar and Hell Up in the Hall and Bucktown, Three to Hard Way, and ran off my own successful line of pictures. In 1967, Stanley Kramer made a movie a pioneering movie called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. And it explored the relationship between an African-American man and a white woman. And it was considered very controversial and very special in its day. Today you make that movie and people tend to think that, well, it's normal to have these kind of interracial, remar interracial marriages. You think that's good? Because I think that's a good thing. Movies are supposed to be about people supposed to be about characters. What we lost between that time and this time are the characterizations of people. It's all about 
people. It's not about color. It's not about, it's not about anything more than how I feel about you and how you feel about me. If you happen to be white and I like you better than at, for this particular moment than this lady sitting over there that happens to be black, that's where I'm going. Movies have changed today because they don't make movies about characters anymore. They don't care about the personality, about the character. They only care about special effects. This is a special effects world we live in. You know, if you can't stare at the camera and have your, have your ears go out and your nose open and your eyes change and you jump in the air and fly away, then you're not really fitting into the mainstream. Mainstream has, has the characterizations of people have been lost in the movies today. Our movies back in the day, starting with that one, was about people was about how people relate to each other. That's what my movies are about. That's why my movies were so successful in the 70s. They were about characters. Black people, there is a def definite difference between black people and white people. The way we walk, the way we talk, the way we express ourselves. So if you're going to make a movie with a black person, you can't take that away. You got to give that back to him. I mean, I'm a Northwestern graduate, but I'm sitting here every now and then. I'll bust a few verbs and say a few things. But I'm an NU graduate, right? And I ain't embarrassing Northwestern by saying ain't and isn't and those. I mean, hey, that's the way I talk, and, and it's me, and, and I'm not going to change that. They don't do that. They don't. They don't care about that today. They want. They just want special effects, and not characterizations. I'm going to give you a blank check right now. You fill in the amount. It is for you to do anything you want to do that you haven't done before. What would you do with it? Give it to a six foot four blonde and run off into the sunset. Cash the check and you'd never see me again. <laughs> and take me with you. <laughs> Thanks, Hannah. Okay.